Pucks with Hags is brought to you by Price Picks and the Game Time app. Welcome to another edition of the Pucks with Hags podcast, powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. This is the 112th episode of the Pucks with Hags podcast. I have with me longtime friend and colleague, uh, Jimmy Murphy. Murph, please tell everybody uh, where they can find your work, my friend. Well, actually, Hags, right now, I'm just uh, written-wise, I am on Substack uh, under Murphy's Hockey Law. So you can find my my scribbles over there. There haven't been too many lately, kind of took the summer off in that regard but uh i'll I'll get that going again soon then of course i'm hosting the eye test podcast on the sick media network with uh pierre mcguire so we're on during the summer we're on every wednesday 4 to 5 p.m eastern all right yeah definitely check that from pierre mcguire uh that's great for all the hockey fans out there and i am also on substack too uh joe haggerty uh dot substack dot com uh subscribe to a, for a premium membership get all of my uh nhl and bruins writing sent straight directly to your inbox um i write three times a week as well for the boston sports journal so definitely check that out at boston sports com. a lot of good stuff on that site as well um you know we're gonna do some fun stuff today murph we're just gonna uh, right. i think we'll we'll kick around uh you know the same old topics. You and I both know this is the dead zone of the hockey off season right now. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's at their cottages in Canada. Everybody's away on vacation, gone fishing. Like basically nothing's going on right now. So we'll also answer uh, a bunch of questions, uh, mailbag style from some fans, which I think is always, you know, that takes us down a different road than we would if we were just kicking around like top, uh, you know, Bruins yeah. hot topics. First, we'll just go with Boston Four sports uh, gets right into the nitty gritty here. Okay. Um, What's the latest on a Swayman extension? Things have seemed quiet for the past few weeks. Um, I think it's pretty much status quo at this point. Uh, you did see pictures um, of uh, Swayman and Omark reunited and hugging mm-hmm. in Italy at uh, Michael Penhollow's wedding. Uh, and congratulations to him, by the way, on getting married. Uh, longtime Bruins employee, great guy. Um, so, like, obviously, they're in Italy at a wedding. There's not much going on right now at this point as far as yeah. negotiations go and closing a deal. Um, he's been in Boston all summer. That's a good sign. They both declined to go uh, arbitration. That's a good sign. I would only start to get nervous about this and worried about this if he packed up and went back to Alaska um, If they or if they got, far, you know, a few days into training camp and nothing was going on. Uh, those are the kind of – times to get nervous times to get worried but i think right now like it's there's there's no natural deadline to get this done right now you know everybody's away and it's not going to get done until they get back yeah i'm with you look i wouldn't expect anything until i mean what when does training camp start for the uh veterans the 18th joe something like that yeah yeah the 18th starts later and later every friggin' year i know i know it's good and of course the seasons keep going later um but you know so if like you said if, if something let's let's just say September 11th, all right? That's the start of rookie camp the week before. Let's say if they're not done by then, I think you can get a little tense and you can wonder what's going on. The only thing I worry about, and it's not so much Swayman, it's his agent, uh, Louis Gross, who is notorious for holdouts, notorious for dragging things out to the deadline. We saw what he did with Nylander in 2018. He brought it down all the way to December 1st deadline at 3 p.m. And the deadline was at 5 p.m. that day. So, he doesn't mind dragging it out and going all the way to the wire. So that's the only thing I worry about. But I don't look, I don't know Nylander as a person, as a player, as well as I know Jeremy Swayman and you know Jeremy Swayman. Yeah. Swayman doesn't seem like the type of A person and B player that would want it to become such a, a drama filled episode like that and let it, you know, creep into the season. It just doesn't seem like his style. I think he just wants to get on the ice and play. And as you pointed out, Joe, he's been here all summer. He's at Warrior a lot. Yeah. He's he's at team events. Um, you know, I, I think he's the type of guy who might, you know, obviously money rules everything, but yeah. I don't think there's any doubt that he's gonna get a lot of money in this deal. Um, I just feel like he's the type of player that might say to the agent, be like, Look, I know that you think you're looking out for my best interests. But I just want to play. Right. So let some. let let's get this done. So yep. I I don't think we have I I do think there is a chance of a holdout, but I don't think it goes deep into camp. I don't think it's anything like you said where he packs up and leaves. I think he's the type of guy like we see right now what's going on with the uh the Patriots and Judon and Judon's still sticking around. He's on the field. He's working out. He's not exactly practicing, 
Um, obviously, there's been some bad blood going on between them the past week. There was a little argument with the coach, but yeah, you know, he's still sticking around. Uh, he hasn't said I want out, and I, I see a similar situation, but even a better situation with Jeremy Swayman and the Bruins. Well, and one thing, and I don't think I've talked to you about this, but I've talked to a lot of other people about it uh, on the podcast. Um, part of the issue, I think, with Jeremy Swayman is that there isn't a comparable player goalie to him that for the money that he's looking for. And I think it's going to be hard for Lewis Gross and Jeremy Swayman's camp if they want eight years, 64, when mm. the guy's never played more than 44 games in the season, when yeah. he's never been a Vesna Trophy finalist, when yeah. he's, you know, he's never even been a starter like by himself in the league yet. And you, mm -hmm. you're going to give him that kind of money. Like I understand that, you know, he, they, they traded Linus Allmark and that was basically them saying, you're our number one guy, you're our starter. Um, but then you have to go out and actually perform and show that you can do it and actually put seasons together where you've done it before you can get paid like that. And I, I Every person that's written about it and, you know, either tried to use like Connor Hellebuck as a comparable to Jeremy Swainwin, which is freaking ridiculous, or basically said, you should just pay him because you said he's your, your number one guy. Like, that's not how negotiations work. No, not they in work. the cap world. No, it's like real estate. <laughs> you have to provide other players and say, this is a comparable. This is a comparable. This is why we should get this amount of money. And there's nobody you can look at that, that signed a – the only one – like, I think he's going to end up getting over seven, even though I don't think there's a comparable that's making over seven either. He's going to probably get something around what Saros got. I just don't think he's going to get eight. I don't think he's going to cross the threshold from seven to eight. I, I think don't either. He's get somewhere in the sevens because I, I, the Bruins, everybody in the league is going to be pissed at them if they sign this guy. That's it, granted, I think he's a number one goalie. I think he's going to be outstanding for the next 10 years. I think he's a franchise guy. He's obviously a stud in the playoffs as he showed yeah. last year. But, like, everybody in the league is going to come down super hard on the Bruins, all the GMs, if they sign him to this huge amount of money and set this precedent that you can give a guy that's only a few years into the league and has been basically sharing time or a backup huge money like that before he goes out and proves it. Yeah, and the other thing we have to factor in too, Joe, and not a lot of people are bringing this up, and I don't know how much of a role it's playing right now in negotiations with Swayman or any player, yeah. is the CBA is up in two years, in yeah. 2026. Yep. Yeah. Look, all things point to the cap continually going up, but there are some, you know, and I'm not trying to bring this into a broader thing, but I'm just, you know, saying it, it could be connected. There are some warning signs that the cap isn't going to go up as much as people like, because you look at what's going on right now, Pags, with TV and TV revenue and, and a lot of people in our business. And, you know, we saw what just happened with Jeff Merrick at sports. And I know there was some kind of weird situation there, but yeah, it's, it's always money related. They're going to look for excuses to get rid of people because they need to cut back on salary and sports. And it took a beating in their TV deal. I haven't seen the numbers of what Turner and ESPN have done in the last, since they signed their contract. It looks good from the outside, but we don't know, but there's a lot of things that factor into contract negotiations when you're looking long-term and clearly a CBA is one of them. So I think if you know, you're know you the GM, you're Don Sweeney, you probably got the Jacobs in your ear saying, just pump the brakes a bit here. We want to give him what he deserves, but don't go overboard here and, and lock us into something that we're going to regret later on yeah. or we can't handle later on. And so there's a lot of factors that go in there. I like what you said, though, about you know he hasn't been a true number one yet. No. What and, happens, and, Murph? What happens if you give him this huge contract, and then he shows physically and mentally he can't play sixty? He's not games durable here, enough, you know, yeah. and like he can't maintain his performance when he's playing that much. Like, what happens then when you pay them that kind of money? Like, they'd be taking a huge unnecessary risk uh, if they went out and and bet on him to be that guy before he's actually gone out and shown it. And and Joe, I got to ask you this too. So when we, you know, when we were talking about this, maybe in May, early June, before they traded Almark, right? We're looking at it like, okay, they're going to trade Almark. They're going to bring Bussy in as the backup. Yep. And Jeremy Swayman's going to be the horse. Well, now they go out and in that Almark deal, they take back a veteran goalie who, yeah, they, you know, they got some of the salary retained, but they're still paying them $3 million. Right. That's a lot of money to pay a quote-unquote backup. So my theory is they don't necessarily see Swayman as being the end-all, be-all I'm going to play 60 to 65, maybe even more games. Right. They, they brought in a guy that they want to be able to come in 
and maybe pick up 20 to 25 games and help Swayman out. Who knows? Yeah. You know, they, they brought in a guy just in case he can handle the durability that they need, like you just said. So I don't think they're looking at him a lot like the fans are looking at him right now, or maybe like his agent is looking at him. So I'm with you 100% on this. I don't think he can cross that $8 million threshold, but I do think he makes out like a bandit and he'll be okay. Well, yeah, it's huge money regardless. Um, But yeah, there's, I mean, there's always a legitimate fear amongst Bruins management about, and with any NHL team, that the one thing that can destroy your team can sink your team can turn you into a cellar dweller immediately is if you have severe goaltending problems. If you Mm -hmm. have bad goaltending, that will kill your team. I don't care how talented they are otherwise. And and I'm sure they envision a scenario where if they went with Swayman and all of a sudden he's getting paid big money and all the pressures on him. And like he, he struggles with the adjustment to that a little bit, or there's an, any kind of an adjustment period there to him getting used to being the guy and yeah. then you have a rookie behind him backing up. That's a recipe for like things that could go wrong and go sideways for them. So I think they were glad to get a guy like Corpus Allo that's a proven commodity right. that can come in and play and maybe play a little bit more. And maybe the Bruins also believe that that's just the best way to get the most out of your goalies is to have a one and a one a, or to have one guy playing 50 to 55 and the other guys playing like 25 to 30 or whatever, you know, like just always yeah. having that kind of scenario rather than having a guy like Hellebuck or Saros that's playing like 65, 66 games a year. Yeah, and I, I even look back, and I, I'm not knocking Carey Price at all. He's one of the greatest goalies ever to play the game, and of our time and of the generation that we've covered uh, Hags. But yep. you look at what happened to him towards the end and how he's he wore down. not as good as when he used to throw his pads at you when you tried to talk to him. <laughs> we can get into that sometime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny you bring him up. I, I I bumped into somebody who knows him very well the other day, and that came up. Uh, any, <laughs> anyhow, um, but, you know, the best goalies, even the best goalies, the most skilled goalies can wear down. Things happen. And, and so I think they know that, and I think they look at it and say, also, we got a lot of money to other areas. You know, I think they've done a great job. I was just looking before we came on here at their salary cap situation going forward in the next four to five years. They're really set on the blue line. They've done a great job of locking in their top four in that blue line. So that's, that's good. But let, you know, you look ahead to the forward position hags and I think we can agree that on a Stanley cup contender that Lindholm is not a true number one center. He's more of a two C and he'd be better slotted there. And then you have coil at the three C. So maybe, you know, you, you need to keep things open. You need to keep options open down the line to fill other areas. So it's not just about Swayman. It's not just about respecting who he is, what he is, and giving him the money. It's about the whole team. And I know fans don't want to hear that. And going back too quickly, not to uh, reverse, but what you said about having the the one A and the one B, you know, even sometimes I'll admit when we're sitting there in a press conference and Sweeney or Montgomery or whether it was Cassidy and, oh, we love the comp or even the goalie saying it. We love having that competition. It pushes it pushes us. You heard all Mark and Swayman say that all the time. A lot of times you think in your head, like, whatever. But it's true. It, yeah. it really is true. Yep. I think it does help keep them on their toes because it's it's human nature that people can get complacent. So I think it helps to have that one B guy. All right. Um, Cap 77. Uh, and this was on the uh, Boston Sports Journal Q&A uh, message board there. I do a Q&A every week. So – I oh, grabbed cool. some of the questions from there because they come up with some good questions on that message board. Um, even if sometimes I'm a little late on the draw answering the questions and they get pissed <laughs> off at me, which I apologize that for. It's a uh, This is from Cap77. Will the Swayman talks drag on like those for Pasternak until the day everyone arrives at Warrior for camp? Does it have to be an eight times eight deal? Do you think that that's maybe part of the holdup is that uh, Swayman's camp has, like, is determined to get eight times eight? And like, I, I honestly do see it. I, I see the most likely scenario being like he mentioned, it's very reminiscent of Pasternak. Don yeah. Sweeney's been very good about like closing these deals, making sure the guys that they want to be Bruins get done. And and it's not a big distraction. It's mm-hmm. not a big problem. And we all remember like w- the whole summer we were talking about Pasternak and the end, he ends up like getting it done. Like, was that at the was, golf tournament? Hag, uh, no, I think that? it was during like weight, te- uh, the, the uh, physical fitness testing or whatever. Okay. All the, All med- right. the physical. Yeah. So after and, that. You know, when they do the pull-ups and Zidane Ochara yeah. used to like, uh, Kevin Miller used to have a pull-up <laughs> off on the first day of camp. I think that's what it was, the very first day. Okay. 
Because we've had a couple at that golf tournament. I can't remember who. Yeah. It was Marshan or Bergeron or one of those guys. Yep. But I, I feel like it's going to be something like that when it gets done. Yeah. It's probably going to be like the first day of camp, and then it'll be like, you know, much ado about nothing. Yep. And I agree. Do you think eight times eight? Do you think that's like. No, like that's... we just said, I don't think he's getting that. I, yeah. I think it's. I'm with. I'm 100% his, do you think you. his camp might be holding out for that? I think they might. That's probably the number they have in their head, I would think. Is they something could like be. That. They could be the other thing, though, Hags, too. Like you, you know, you you started off the top of the show talking about what a dead zone this is right now. Yeah. They might already have who knows? Maybe they have something in place and they're just like, let's just wait until later. Yep. You know, when we get back, when everybody's getting back in a groove, we'll announce it then. So I, I again don't be worried right now, Bruins fans. But if we get in two, three weeks into camp and it's not done, then you can start to get a little tense. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with game time, the Red Sox, Fenway Park, uh Jaron Duran, uh the putting on a show at the MLB All-Star Game. So you may want to dig into your pocket and actually like spend some money on some Red Sox tickets based on Jaron Duran and the season he's having. This is this is one of those seasons where I think you're going to want to watch because uh, he's in the middle of putting something together pretty special. You're going to say you were in the stands and you saw Jaron Duran like, do something crazy uh, when you were actually watching one of the games at Fenway. So go to game time. Uh, Last-minute deals, save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater. Uh, zone deals save even more when you choose a section and let game time choose the seats uh lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110 percent of the difference take the guesswork out of getting red Sox tickets at fenway this summer with game time download the game time app create an account use the code clns for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms do apply but again create the account and redeem the code clns for 20 dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed uh, best and worst coach, and this is also from Cap seventy seven. Best and he comes up with good questions. I like his questions because they're league wide, not just Bruins wide. Yeah. Best and worst coaching hires around the league this off season, and like I'm gonna say the Ooh. worst one I think is Lindy Ruff two point in Buffalo. I just don't <laughs> like that one. I think they're 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 like they need to go. I think with a young, innovative coach, like somebody that can uh, you know is going to be good with that group. Like Lindy Ruff had a young group that was a young, skilled offensive group in New Jersey, and he obviously wasn't the right fit there. I don't know why he's going to be the right fit in Buffalo, aside from that he's obviously was a longtime, you know, icon there as a coach and was there for a lot of years. So they're they're trying to recreate what he had when they, frankly, they didn't even win a cup the first time around. Like he, he was yeah. the coach when uh, Milan Lucic hit Ryan Miller and like basically like friggin' put that sand franchise back for like 10 years with, with that whole thing. Um, so I don't like his hire there. And I don't, was Patrick, I can't remember. Patrick Roy was not an off season. He was no, that was at in. the end of the year, right? Yeah. That was right before the trade deadline. I, I just love uh, Patrick Roy being in the league. Like I want Patrick Roy in the NHL. I want him coaching. I want his personality there. He's one of those guys that's going to be fiery, unpredictable, exciting like i want him around in the league somewhere so i was i was glad for that hire and i think that could be uh the right fit for for that islanders team that probably has not had enough of a kick in the butt the last few years yeah i'm with you on that i mean look i i don't know what buffalo is trying to do i i, I gave up long ago trying to figure out their direction i don't think they know it either uh, like you said, it's like now they're going back to the past and they try to go to the future with a young guy. They're all over the place. So, yeah, I'm not exactly thrilled with that hire. Um, the other one I look at that was kind of two of them, actually, that are very similar in my eyes that I question were St. Louis with Bannister. And this is no knock on him. I think he's a good rising coach. I just don't think he's ready for the head coaching job yet. I think he would have been a good assistant. I also think maybe he even needed a few more years down in Springfield. I, I was, you know, and I was living out there uh, right after the, or during a pandemic and right after. I caught a lot of those games there, and they went on a run to the conference final one year, Hags. He did a great job with that team and really good job with those young kids. But, you know, from people I know within that, it just doesn't seem like he was ready. And it almost feels like he was a consolation uh, as opposed to maybe some of the guys they wanted to get. And then I look similar position, Jim Hiller in L.A. I just yeah. think that, I think that team where they are right now, in that market, trying to stay relevant, uh, where they are in the direction of the team. I think they needed a bigger hire. I, I really do. And I wonder, and I look, I don't want to get into the whole Blackhawks history thing and everything went on with, with Joe Quinville, but I wonder right now with him being reinstated, if either of those two teams, St. Louis obviously already yeah. had him once, 
if either of them is saying, damn, we should have waited, we could have got a, a Stanley Cup champion coach with a lot more experience, a lot more pizzazz. Of course, maybe they want to stay away from the controversy outside the rink there. But I, I just look at those two hires as maybe like they weren't, I don't think they're ready yet. Uh, but around the league, I don't really have a problem with many of the hires that went on this summer. Um, trying to look at the list right now. I like, uh, there's a couple others I like a lot. Um, Ryan Wasofsky in San Jose. I, I think he's going to, a young, yeah, I think he's, he's a young, that, he's perfect like, for that right team. coach where yep. I think it's the right fit there. And I think he's the right, that's the right group of players in, in organization, I think, for them to take a chance on a young coach and, and show a vote of faith in a young coach like that. And the other one I, I really like is Barubi in Toronto. I think he's exactly what Toronto mm-hmm. Maple Leafs need. That's where I was going to go. Fit there. Yeah. I'm with you there. The Bosma one in Seattle, I do like because he is a veteran and he did go back to the A, did some yep. time there, really is familiar with what they're bringing up. I think they're a team that, yeah, I know they made the playoffs in their first year and they upset the Avs in that seven game series with the time with the defending champions. But clearly that was kind of a, a blip, you know, and then they're, they're building towards something right now. I think he's a good coach for that. I, I totally agree with you on, on Barubi there. One guy I'm surprised that kind of survived just with all the change that's going on, including moving, is in Utah, and that's Andre Tarigny. And it's not yeah. a knock on him. I just felt like, okay, maybe it's a new team, new ownership. They want to come in with a splash and maybe make, you know get a big name in there. So I was surprised he made that, but good for him. Um, and then I look around. There's a lot of good assistant coach hires. Uh, Travis Green. In Ottawa is an interesting one to me. Yeah. Um, Hags, that team, I think, really, it's now or never for them, right? Because we've been waiting for them to turn that corner and make the playoffs. They've got a lot of skill. I know they've dealt with some injuries. And then they now they've the got suspension. a goalie. They got a goalie now. Yeah. Uh, I like that hire there. Uh, one I, I don't get, okay? And, <laughs> you know, Keith. Bruins, yes. Like, what, what has Sheldon Keith done Yeah. besides lose to the Bruins? Over and over again. The one thing. What, I what will, has he the, done? The one thing I will say, Murph, um, and I don't. I don't necessarily love that hire either. But the one. I think thing, Lindy Ruff was perfect there. I would have never got rid of him. Yeah. The one thing I like about him, at least that I saw in the last playoffs, is the way he had the Leafs playing in that mm. series against the Bruins. Like they turned he, the defense. He gotten them to buy in, and they were playing defensive hockey. They were playing the way you you need to play to win in the playoffs. Like I actually liked the way the Leafs played in that first round series. I did too. Wall Wall getting hurt in game seven killed them. Like that was like yeah. that, that was like the beginning of the end and the death knell for them. But like maybe they win that series if Joe Wall uh, doesn't get hurt and he's able to play yeah. in that game. And, and I will say it, like to his defense, I liked that. But like there was obviously so much babying and coddling going on of those superstar players. And there was so much that I don't I think he didn't stand up to or really like seize control of like he needed to in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And you wonder if it's going to be the same thing in New Jersey with the same kind of players playing for the Devils. Yeah, a lot of high-end yeah. skill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm interested to see how the relationship with him and Dougie Hamilton manifests. <laughs> we'll see. You're my friend, Dougie. <laughs> Only player to ever like get in get in a, a pissing contest with me and an argument with me on the first day of development camp when he was like an 18 year old kid. <laughs> And used to pull the, like, I don't want to talk to everybody if that person's in the scrum. Remember he did that a couple of times oh, to people? You're gosh. like, who, who the F is this kid? Like, get yeah. out of here. Yeah. Go have your mom and dad complain to the GM that you're not playing. Okay, now you said it. See, I didn't know if we were going to say, if we were going to go there. But yeah, yeah, yeah it, it happened. Yeah. You know? um, all right. Next question. Uh, this is from Ryan M. Double Zero on BSJ Q&A board. Uh, is Jim Montgomery going to get an extension? He's had young players make major strides under him. Pasternak has had his best two years offensively and did improve in the playoffs. Those are true. Would mm-hmm. assume he would be highly t- ticketed if they don't get him something. This Pat, I think we've talked about this a little bit, Murph. I think this mm-hmm. is fascinating uh, mm-hmm. and really interesting that he does not have an extension to this point. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the Bruins like could just decide, you know, they're waiting until the start of training camp could extend them at the beginning of training camp, have an announcement, do the dog and pony show uh, and end like any conversation about this whatsoever. But I, I think we were all know that he, he signed a three year deal when he was hired and he's in the last year of his contract now uh, from what I was told. And mm-hmm. if they let him go into the year as a lame duck coach, especially where they hired a guy in Jay Leach 
to be an assistant that was one of the guys they interviewed for the head coaching job when Montgomery was originally hired. Um, mm -hmm. And the, like the last time they had a coaching change in season, you remember who they put on the you know, Claude Julian staff uh, before they made the move in the middle of the year, right? Bruce Cassidy was on that mm -hmm. staff. Mm -hmm. So like there's an MO there or there's uh, a pattern there of them putting the guy they want already on their staff when the season starts and sort of having it already in place if that's what they want to do. Now, mm -hmm. you balance all that off with what he said, and just the regular seasons have been outstanding. Like, I think he did a better job coaching this past year than when he won the Jack Adams the year before. I do, too. He's done a very good uh, job in the regular season. I liked that he challenged the players more this past season, uh, and mm -hmm. he was more, you know, hard-nosed about be, uh, being a head coach when he had to be and kind of had a little bit more of an attitude with them when they weren't meeting expectations. I liked that, and I thought he, they made an, a decent step in the playoffs – um, you know, obviously not enough yet. And I know Don Sweeney had mentioned displeasure with the fact that they couldn't even get to a game seven against Florida and that they really wanted that in that second round series. But you're also talking about the team, a team that ended up winning the cup and a team that um, I think you battled just as hard as anybody else did in the playoffs, probably harder, like maybe Edmonton, you could also make the argument, but I think those were the two toughest opponents that the Florida Panthers had in that whole run. Um, so like I, if I'm Jim Montgomery, I probably think I've earned an extension and why do I have to go into the season in the last year of my deal? And I think that's just setting up for, for a lot of like questions uh, if they don't sign them to an extension. 100% agree with you. And I, I like the point you make about the analogy you made about Leach and Cassidy. Uh, the other thing I will point out in that same regard is the elevation of Joe Sacco to associate head coach, yeah. giving him clearly openly saying we're giving him more of a say on the more, bench. More uh, so yeah. I, that kind of, you know, raises a, we'll call it a red flag, but it's just a little something to think about there. Yeah. Um, but I'm with you. I think he hundred percent has earned it. The one thing I will say that, uh, and I love the point you made because I don't think that's been said enough hags is what you said that he did a much better coaching job this past season yes. than when he won the Jack Adams, because let's face it, hags. You and I could have at least got the Bruins to 500 coaching the team he had the year before with how stacked it was and how good it was. And, you know, those players, Krejci, Bergeron, they were running the show a lot yeah. too. For, yeah. And he admitted that. He, he, he basically, I said it to him one time. I said to him, I said, you know, is having Bergeron is like having Reg Dunlop on the bench. You know, he's like the player coach. And he laughed and he said, you're exactly right though. I mean, it's, it's a great asset for me to have. And I lean on him heavily. Yep. And you saw in that Florida series, when he couldn't lean on him as much, it hurt. The yeah. one thing I, I, I do get a little nervous about, and I'll circle it back to when we were talking about Sheldon Keefe and the Maple Leafs, and I'll draw it into the Florida series this year. The one thing I see is sometimes in the playoffs, he has had trouble adapting as a series has gone on. Yeah. And, yep. you know, you, you talked about how Sheldon Keefe adapted – to the series against the Bruins and got them to a game seven after going down three, one, I I've kind of seen the same thing with uh, the opposite thing I should say with Jim, yep. but I think he's earned it. I, I mean, I think he, I, the players like him. Um, it's, a, it's a good matchup right now. It, you, I think you need to decide this. I think you're exactly right. You don't want that hanging over anyone's head going into this season. You need to decide that before the season starts. Yeah. And yeah, I, I just think it, it turns into a situation that could get out of your control fast if he doesn't have a contract beyond this year and everybody knows it. And, you yep. know, because we're you and I are going to start talking about well, it more. That's just yeah, that's I mean, our job three games in a <laughs> row. And like everything that's going to what it's going to be about, you know, that's what mm -hmm. the conversation is going to be about. Um, so if they want to avoid that, I think they would sign him to an extension by the same token. I'm sure um, that Jeremy Jacobs in Delaware North does not want to pay a coach not to coach. You know, they don't mm -hmm. want a guy to sign a guy to an extension and then have them sit around after they fire him and they have to pay him, um, you know, to not be their coach. You know, yep. like they that's something they do not want to do and no team wants to do. But like I, I could see that being, a, you know, a bone of contention with Don Sweeney and Cam Neely if. Uh, you know, Bruins ownership is paying out money to a coach that's like not coaching that they fired yeah. and decide to make another move. So I think that's going to cause them to use caution before they sign them to an extension. When, when, let's face it, we're starting to talk about big money with coaches too. You know, they don't get paid chump change anymore. You're talking about millions yeah. of dollars. So that, you know, that's the other part of it too. Uh, but that's going to be something really interesting to watch. Um, all right. This is from uh, 
T. Kavorki on uh, the Boston Sports Journal Q&A board again. Look forward to Zadorov bringing an in intimidation element that the Bees have lacked for a while. He's been in the league for 11 seasons, and the Bees are his sixth team. Any reason for concern about that? Yes, and uh, Pierre Maguire brought this up on the eye test the other day. He pointed out, we were talking about, look, we, we all agree he's going to help. He's, a, he's, he's perfect to put in that second pairing slot on the left. And, and maybe you, you, you switch him back and forth between the first pairing and the second pairing. You can do a lot of things there. It gives them options. It gives them, as, as the uh, reader or call there said, uh, that intimidation factor as well. But you do have to wonder, why so many teams? Yeah. You, you know, and why – why does he keep switching? And, and he's had some good years and still switch teams. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't have it, but I think it's a valid question. And, you know, maybe we'll do some digging. We'll try and find out what the answer is to that. But other than that, I like the signing. I was hoping for a while, and I think you know this, I was campaigning for it openly. I think Noah Hannafin would have been the perfect fit for them on that left side there. It would have solved a lot more problems uh, and obviously brought a lot more high-end skill. Yep. Um, but I don't not like this signing. Um, I just don't, you know, I don't get why that many teams uh, throughout his career. That's the only question mark I have with him. The one thing I would say um, that might be uh, something that gets him traded or gets, you know, is something that could rub somebody the wrong way organizationally at some point is just that I think he, from what I, the people that I've talked to, He's a very outspoken guy. He's a very opinionated guy. He doesn't make uh, any. Well, he bones. won't be playing for Russia ever again. I'll tell no. you that. Well, he, you know, he doesn't beat around the bush. Really, he's pretty blunt with his assessments yeah. and his comments yeah. and his, you know, mm -hmm. it's his his opinions about things. And I'm sure that ends up rubbing some people the wrong way, just because anybody that has strong opinions like that yeah. isn't afraid to air them. Like some people just aren't going to like it. That's just yeah. part of being that kind of person. I love it though. Oh, I love it too. <laughs> you know, honestly, Murph, I, bring it on. <laughs> I got to be honest. It's great for us, obviously, because like yeah. he's opinionated, he's not uh, shy around the microphone. Like he's willing to talk like all that stuff. And he's willing to talk about league things, world things like whatever. But I also think the Bruins needed a guy like that. They, they needed a they guy in a while. that was going to like tell it like it is when there's yep. problems, call people out if they need to be called out and not be afraid to do it and kind of be a mm -hmm. badass about it. Like that's the kind of guy. That, and I'm not saying they're the same person or a player, but he, that's the kind of guy Sean Thornton was that was a perfect fit for this Bruins teams back in the day is he yep. would call out bullshit. Like he was also a guy that was, they called the Sean father. He would hook up players with stuff. Like he had all kinds of connections. Like he knew how to play the game, but he also was a guy that if he, you needed to be called out or he needed to cut somebody down to size or, you know, tell them something that they needed to hear, he was the guy that was going to do it. And he was not afraid yeah. to do that. And he had, yeah. he had the respect of everybody to do that. So I think that's something, you know, that that's the kind of element that I think this team at times could be a little bit soft about stuff like that or not be willing to really like mm -hmm. say what needed to be said. And I think he's the kind of guy that will do that. But by the same token, I think that's going to cause friction at times or, you know, be something that's going to have to be managed. Yeah, it's, I totally 100% agree. And maybe it's just a matter of him learning the timing of it and when yeah. to say it and and, which, and, which and he probably reading, has 11 years into the league. At this yeah, point, he's I would probably got it now. that stuff out. You yeah, know? yeah. So I, I, I like it. I think it's going to be a good signing. I'm not worried about it. All right. So this came from Joseph O'Malley on my Facebook fan page. And this good is actually Irish name. Wade into, yes, wade into the uh, Blackhawks thing a little bit. Oh, um, okay. Maybe on a Pucks with Hags podcast, you could explain why Stan Bowman is worth one of the 32 GM spots. So it's clearly this is somebody that, uh, has hard feelings about the way the Blackhawks thing was handled, but we all know Bowman was reinstated. Uh, and you talked about Quinville. He does not have a job currently, head coaching job, but he's, uh, I believe, open to getting an NHL employment now too. Um, do you feel like Stan Bowman deserves a second chance and is worthy of one of these GM spots? If if everything I've read um, that he did, you know, do what he was supposed to, he, he did the the work and he really – it sounds like he he really reached out uh, to Kyle Beach. It, I mean, look, I I've gotten two, three, four chances in life on things that I've screwed up on. I'm not going to sit here and try and take away a second chance for somebody else. I don't condone at all what happened. I think it's horrible, um, and I don't think it should have ever gotten to the point that it did. Um, but if he if all that I've read is true. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody deserves a second chance. Uh, and as long as 
as we've read, that Kyle Beach is not against this right now. And he hasn't come out and vocally said it. And he says that, you know, look, he has reached out to me. He has shown remorse. He's looked for forgiveness. Uh, then, yeah, I think everybody deserves a second chance. And, it, you know, as far as a hockey resume goes, I don't think anyone can argue what he brings there. So I think it's a good hockey hire for the Edmonton Oilers. I, I do want to say, though, you know, just with the Oilers there, even if they didn't bring in Stan Bowman, I think Jeff Jackson has done a great job there uh, with the Oilers really not – making that they, they were always at they were like what we i like to call them the maple leafs west you know this high-end skill team like you mentioned earlier they could never play defense that yep. the others were the same thing but if you watch that team throughout this playoff their bread and butter was defensive hockey and their pk uh and they got some unbelievable goaltending from skinner as it went on so i think they're heading in the right direction it's a good hockey hire as far as the outside stuff goes obviously i hate what happened um but if he has paid the price to earn that second chance and so be it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Like, I think at a certain point, once the NHL has deemed that they've done the work and that they've paid the penance and that they've, you know, done what they were supposed to do, then I think it's it's time for people to sort of move on and accept um, that people do deserve second chances if they've done the right things. And if they are truly, uh, sh if they've truly showed contrition about what uh, what act they played in that whole situation, which, you know, I think was, you know, that could have just happened anywhere necessarily. It, it happened in Chicago, but I think there's a lot of NHL spots that something like that could have happened. Um, I bet it has. In, in, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And, but that served as a warning and as a message to every single NHL team. And by having these executives and coaches like sit on the sidelines for a while, I think people realize now what the consequences are if they don't treat this situations like this in the proper now, how way. How many years was it Hugs? What's that, that? That he was out. How many years was he out? Two, three? Yeah, a couple. A couple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Cause it wasn't um yeah, it was like two, right? Because then uh yeah. Quinville was the coach of the Panthers and then he had to leave, so he's been gone. And then Maurice years. came in. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, Oh no, Brunette. Know. Brunette. Yeah, Brunette. Brunette. Maurice. So it's been yeah. like three years, I think. Yeah. Um so. all right. So uh next question from Jimmy on the BSG Q and A board. And I don't think it was Jimmy Murphy. <laughs> uh, where do the bees rank in their division if they stand pat how about in the east the league i feel like the bees are marginally better overall than last year but have like a 30 or 40 percent chance to improve their results from last year which might be all we can hope for but honestly i was hoping for more like i don't know what more you really could be hoping for at this point given what they did i think they got two impact players in free agency in zadorov and lindholm um, they're going to re-sign Jeremy Swayman. You know, they recouped a first round pick uh, by trading uh, Linus Olmark. They brought in uh, a player in Max Jones, who I think could be a really nice reclamation project for the Boston Bruins and could be a really good fit with the Bruins uh, mm -hmm. coming from Anaheim. Um, they're going to give a guy like Fabian Lysel, I think, every chance to win uh, a spot on this team and put him potentially in a plum top six right wing spot with Charlie Coyle and Brad Marchand. If he's, he does the right things, like I, I like what they've done. I think they're, they've the, the, with the, the, the players they've added, I think they're going to be significantly better than they were last year. Um, as, as far as like a team that could win in the playoffs, do I think regular season, they're going to be significantly better? No. Cause they had a very good regular season last year. I think they, yeah. they probably be somewhere around the same, but I think that the way that they now covet, size heaviness strength maybe a little nasty like some of the stuff that they like have decided to accumulate more of as uh, uh an organization mm -hmm. is going to pay dividends for them in the playoffs and you've seen this over the last few years they've really figured this out whether it was a few years ago getting orlov and hathaway at the deadline whether it was getting pat maroon at this trade deadline whether it was the guys that they went out and got and now they're uh, the smallest defenseman is Charlie McAvoy at 6'1", 210 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't draft a guy that was under six foot three in the draft. Like they clearly are starting to realize that they have to be bigger and stronger and tougher and more physical if they're going to win in the playoffs, just seeing how the Florida Panthers did it. So I think they're going to be better when it matters based on the, the changes that they made. And like being better in the East, being I think if they're around where they were last year in the East, that's totally fine during the regular season. And this is about them being like incrementally better or significantly better in the playoffs. 
hundred percent agree with everything you said. And, and, you know, just to, uh, to echo on the whole thing about greediness and size and all that, like you said, it's not just at the NHL level that they're accumulating this, they're doing it through the draft now as well. I mean, yeah. you look at their first round pick that they made. So um, the one thing I'll say, and look, I think they make the playoffs. And as long as you make the playoffs, it's, <laughs> It's not a cliche. You make the dance, anything can happen. Yep. Um, so I, I'm with you. I actually don't think they will finish as high as they did in the division, in the conference, in the league, as they did last year. But I think they make the playoffs. And then I think, given if they're healthy, depending on what moves they might have made by that time, um, I think they can make a run. They, you know, they're, they're a team that could challenge at least to make the conference final. Um, but you look at the Atlantic division and yeah. Pags, and one could argue – that this is the toughest division in hockey right yep. now. It either go with that or the Pacific. Um, but you look at that division, you got to think. We were talking earlier about uh, the Buffalo Sabres. When are they ever going to turn it around? Okay, so there's a team that's pushing to make the playoffs. You 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 looked at the Ottawa Senators. That's a team that could push for the playoffs Detroit. right now. The Detroit Red Wings, I think, are knocking on the door right there. Yep. They're, they're kind of, you know, the eyes are plan. I think that's reached its max now and it's now playoffs or bust for them. Yep. So I think they're going to, I think they're going to make some kind of move. Maybe it's before the season or in the season to make sure that they're in the playoffs this year and they break their drought. So I'm looking at it right now, Hags. And if I'm looking at the eight teams out of the East, I feel confident saying that five of them will be from the Atlantic division. That's how good the Atlantic division is. So it's going to be a lot of competition throughout the regular season, but as long as the Bruins stay healthy, as long as the Swayman situation is resolved and he can handle his new workload, I think they make the playoffs and then they can do some damage. Do you think, uh, do you see any of the sort of traditional uh, Atlantic teams sort of dropping back? Um, like, to, I, I look at Tampa and I see a team that might be. They're a crapshoot to me. Might be starting to like come back to regress to the mean, getting a little old. Like, they. Losing Stamkos, losing their captain is a big deal. Like I don't care what it really is. says. Losing yep. that guy that's been the unflappable leader, that's been the center of everything that they've done, and letting him go and sign elsewhere. Not only does that affect them just by his presence being missing, I think not keeping him around and not showing him loyalty is also going to affect that team and the players on that team. Like I think there's long-standing effects from that way that situation played out. I totally agree with you. And, you know, there the, was it like two questions ago, You were, somebody was saying they could have done a little better in free agency. If That would be the only guy where I could say they, they did better than what they did. That yeah. would be the only guy at the center position that I was looking at, like, well, I'd rather him than Lindholm. Um, but, yeah, you can't undervalue what that leadership role and, and just the staple he was, the pillar he was in that organization for, you know, so many years now. That's a huge loss. The only thing I wonder with Tampa, though, they did go out and get canceled. Okay. Yep. Um, they did bring back McDonough, McDonough. So that is going to bring back some leadership there. It's going to add some grit on the blue line. Um, McDonough's getting long look, in the tooth, though. He's starting they to are getting long in the tooth. They are getting long in the tooth. Uh, they got a little smaller overall. But the X factor, as it always is, and we started the show off with it, is goaltending. Yeah. Does Vasilevsky come back on a war path? Is he out to prove that last year was an anomaly? That's the one thing I look at there, but I'm with you. If that's one of the teams that's been a steady playoff team that could drop out, I'm with you. It could be the Tampa Bay Lightning. Yeah, I could say, I just don't. And think I don't, I don't think the Florida Panthers are as good this year. They, they no, took they, some big losses. Yeah. Yep. They did. Montour's gone. Um, Their power play is going to suffer. Tarasenko's gone. Like a lot of the depth is gone and they've lost some, some key players. There's no question about yep. it. Yep. Um, but so that, but I still think, you know, they're, the bones of that team, I think, are still very good. I think they're a playoff team. Do I? Think they got some young guys coming too. Yeah. Do I think they're going to win the cup? Probably not. Again, probably not. But that's extremely difficult to do anyway. Well, and don't forget, Hags, they were in the cup the year before too, so they're going to have quite the cup hangover yep, right now. In that's terms true. Of, you know that that catches up to you as we saw with Tampa. Yep. And uh, I think you know Toronto is Toronto. Like they're going to have a good regular season, but I don't expect anything out of them come playoff time. Just as no currently goalie. constituted. No goalie. No, it's insanity. Like they keep yeah. like no watching defense. them flame out in the playoffs and don't change anything. Like, yeah, keep the band playing because everybody buys tickets <laughs> during the regular season and you know has uh, has Marner jerseys and Nylander jerseys and uh, Matthews jerseys and. Well, know. the Marner thing's interesting too, though. What happens with that? That's a huge factor in in where Toronto goes. So. Oh yeah, hundred um, percent. Nobody. That's kind of the the little secret nobody's talking about right now. 
So, yep, it's going to be interesting. Uh, Murph, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate Always it. Always a pleasure, man. And, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Until next time, everybody, thanks for listening. We'll see you at the ring.